If there's anything that I can ever do as far as this fight for freedom is concerned, certainly count on me. Jackie Robinson was his Superman. He was his hero, his absolute hero. Kurt Flood was a hell of a ball player. If you ask me, would Kurt Flood be the kind of guy to sue baseball? I'd say no. Kurt Flood was born on January 18, 1938 in Houston, Texas, but moved to California when he turned two years old. By the age of seven, Kurt was noticed for his unbeatable speed and found baseball as an escape from the ghettos of West Oakland. After graduating from Oakland Technical High School, Kurt was signed by the Cincinnati Reds for a $4,000 contract, but was then traded to the St. Louis Cardinals on December 5, 1957. After his third season with the team, Flood became an untouchable center fielder. He approached Cardinals owner Austin Bush Jr. to request a raise from $70,000 to $100,000, but agreed to $90,000. For a man who makes $90,000 a year, which isn't exactly slave wages, what's your retort to that? Uh, a well-paid slave is nonetheless a slave. In the seventh game of the 1968 World Series, Kurt Flood misjudged a fly ball, turning a hit by Jim Northrup into a two-run triple that assisted the Tigers to win the series. The same thing almost happened earlier in the game to Jim Northrup, and now it has happened to one of the greatest defensive center fielders in baseball, Kurt Flood. As he started over, something happened to his underfooting. Watch this now. He catches his spike, see? And he nearly fell down. And that cost him gauging the ball. Flood very rarely has ever uh, misjudged the ball out there, but when he stumbled on his way, it threw him out of his path. He couldn't get back. The ball sailed over his head. And the Tigers now have two runs in the seventh. And this all came after two out, nobody on. Flood had agonized all winter about his misplay and was sure Bush was going to send him away, which he had the right to do. Management waited until after the 1969 season to trade Flood to the Philadelphia Phillies. After refusing to be traded, Flood challenged a reserve clause, which was a contractual agreement that secured players to a single team unless traded, sold, or released. Appointed executive director of the Players Union in 1966, economist Miller began looking for a means to challenge the reserve clause. Cardinal outfielder Kurt Flood volunteered. The legality of Major League Baseball's controversial reserve clause is now in the hands of the Supreme Court. The case involves the trade of Kurt Flood from St. Louis to Philadelphia. Emphasizing he was not a piece of property to be traded or sold in an owner's whim, Kurt challenged the move to Philly by bringing suit against Major League Baseball. Represented by Arthur J. Goldberg, Kurt filed a $1.4 million legal dispute against Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, after rejecting his request that baseball put an end to the clause. The case began in May 1970, and as time progressed, Flood was not doing well financially. He signed with the Washington Senators for the 1971 season, but several death threats later, he quit the game he loved so dearly after just 13 games with the team. After his first plane ride to Tampa, where his training camp for the Reds was located, Flood was introduced to racial discrimination when he noticed water fountains labeled white and colored. Kerr was inspired to challenge the clause to the civil rights movement and the fact that many white players received higher salaries than colored players. Exempted from antitrust laws, the national pastime was long run by owners determined to maintain that control. Racial politics simply extended that control. During the 1960s, Kurt Flood is one of the top salaried players in Major League Baseball. But many things in the game are troubling to him. One thing in particular. You have to understand the baseball players at that time. We thought getting $20,000 a year was a fair share of this incredible amount of revenue that's being made in baseball. I knew that, it, that the reserve clause in my contract was illegal. And I thought that I was the one to make the difference in, in our contracts. Legally, a contract must have a beginning and an end. But the reserve clause perpetuated this year after year, even though you only had a one-year contract. That clause 
in your contract perpetuated it until you died. As a matter of fact, if they resurrected Babe Ruth, the Yankees would still own him. Kurt was defeated in his Supreme Court hearing on June 6, 1972. Despite not gaining his own financial benefits, he paved the way for future baseball stars. Every player in every team sport owes a debt of gratitude to Kurt Flood, says Ross Greenberg, president of HBO Sports. His life story is a very complex character study. His battle to win free agency and have the right to choose where to work is an inspiring story. He is one of the giants in the history of sports, but has largely been forgotten. In 1975, federal judge Peter Seitz declared that since two pitchers, Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally, played without a contract for one year, they were not committed to the team. This meant that they were free agents and could negotiate a contract to play for any team. The Curt Flood Act was issued by President Clinton after Flood's death, which stated, Major League Baseball players are covered under the antitrust laws. As Larry Malfi and Jonathan Kronstadt say in their book titled, Crossing the Line, Black Major Leaguers, Babe Ruth changed the way baseball was played, Jackie Robinson changed who played it, and Curt Flood changed its balance of power. I don't think I'll be forgotten very soon because I was one of the first to stand up and say, hey, at one point in your life, you ought to be able to control your career. And that's what it was all about.